when we come together in unity, the windows of heaven will open and we will receive the revelation that we need. Think about that the next time you're in ward council or a presidency meeting or in family council or talking to someone you love. Okay, unity is absolutely key. And with that, we can turn the page and see chapter eight, which so many of you are, are already experts in. So I'm just going to point out some interesting things to ponder as you study chapter eight, which is Lehi's dream. Uh, there are paintings and sculptures and movies and cartoons and all kinds of things, songs made of this one chapter. And in some ways, this is a foundational chapter for so much of what comes beyond. In some ways, in fact, if Lehi has been reading the books of Moses and starting with the creation and the fall, he's been reading about a tree of life. And the need for a, that first family of humanity to leave it, that's the fall. But the rest of their life will be spent trying to regain it in the Lord's right way. Hmm, no wonder he has this on the mind when he falls asleep and ends up dreaming of paradise. Now, when he, when he does this, something I want you to think about is his target audience. This surprised me once it actually dawned on me with the help of a few pronouns. Early on in this, this is verse 3 and 4 of chapter 8, he says, I, I, I've, I've dreamed a dream, I've seen a vision, I want to tell you all of you, I mean, this is family home evening, right? And so gather around everybody, I've got a story to tell. But it's interesting the way it's phrased. He says, I have reason to rejoice in the Lord because of Nephi and also of Sam. For I have reason to suppose that they, hmm, there's the third person, they, he's talking about them, not to them, that they and also many of their seed will be saved. But behold, Laman and Lemuel, I fear exceedingly because of you. And the you is a second person pronoun. He's not talking about Laman and Lemuel. He's talking to Laman and Lemuel. Please keep that in mind in everything else that we read in this chapter, that they are his target audience. Because when he realizes in the dream that, I mean, just read it and you'll see it unfold, that he's in a dark and dreary waste. Hmm, sound familiar, Laman and Lemuel? That's kind of felt, like, felt that way here in the wilderness, hasn't it? In my dream, I was following some guy in a white robe. A oh, white robe. Seems like a heavenly messenger. That, well, that's what brought me out into this dark and dreary wilderness. I was following the commands of God. And in some ways, if I'm the guy wearing the white robe in your lives, well, thanks for at least following me this far. But what's interesting about Lehi's journey in the dream that parallels Laman and Lemuel's journey in real life, out in this Dark and dreary wilderness, they go, and he's just following along. No idea. Nothing's changing. I wonder how long that took, actually. And how long Laman and Lemuel would go, just following, but blindly and angrily, unwillingly, until, Lehi says, I prayed. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, oldest sons. Because once I prayed, I began seeing things that must have been there all along. All of a sudden, I saw the destination. I saw what this journey would be for. I saw how worth it it would all be. Because I saw a tree, who, that, and the fruit of that tree, he gives this string of superlatives. It's so beautiful. White above anything I've ever seen. Sweet above anything I'd ever tasted. More desirable than any other fruit. This is the goal. This is the focal point of the dream and of the Book of Mormon. He doesn't say what it means. It's just, you got to taste it. You got to try this thing. I don't even know what to call it. Okay. Taste is one of those senses that it's almost impossible to describe. You just take it and the juice is still dripping off your lips and you're just, oh, you got to try this thing. And that's what he's hoping for. Sons, when will you pray? for your eyes to open. The way Lehi says it is, I prayed for mercy out of the Lord's abundant, tender mercies, the multitude of his tender mercies. Sounds like he read the thesis statement too, <laughs> right? I, I, I know what God is like. I have a true understanding of his 
character and attributes and perfections. Joseph Smith, by the way, said that is an absolute requirement for real faith. Otherwise, you will know not the dealings of that God that created you, and you'll end up murmuring. Right, Lemuel, Lemuel? But I knew God was a God of tender mercies, and so I prayed for mercy, and all of a sudden, the dark and dreary waste tur turned into a wide and spacious field, but I saw the tree that drew all my attention. Once I ate the fruit, I was so changed by it, I started looking around. It says he cast his eyes about, hoping to find his family. And that's the natural thing. Oh, those who join the church and then want all their friends and family members to learn about it. Best missionaries are recent converts, right? And he goes and finds his family off in the distance, down by some river he hadn't even noticed before. And he doesn't yet notice that that river is filthy in its water. We'll need some help next week for Nephi to show us that. I love how laser-focused Lehi is on goodness on God, on love, on fruit, and family, and to the point that I can't see anything negative anymore. I prayed, and because of God's abundant tender mercies, the darkness is gone. I can't even smell the stench of the sewage that's going by. Oh, it's just a river as far as I'm concerned. But as I followed it to its source, I realized that, oh, that's where my family is. And so what does he do? He beckoned, that's his word, and he used a loud voice. Sometimes that's what it takes. C come see. Come and see. Come this way. I'm eating fruit like you'd never believe. And that's all it takes for Sariah and Nephi and Sam to come running. It's interesting to me. I think in some ways, because we know this story so well, we make some assumptions. And so I would actually challenge you to reread chapter 8 as if it were brand new. Forget everything you think you know and just start. That's why... This week, I'm not going to tell you what the tree represents and what the rod represents and what the river represents and what the, the building represents because we don't know yet. Lehi never explains. For that, we'll have to wait till next week when Nephi gets it all. Okay, We'll never learn it from Lehi. Now, as he see, so, so here's the point. How does Lehi get to the tree? No rod for him. He follows the man with the white robe. And simply following Jesus is an amazing way to reach the tree and partake of its fruit. How about Nephi, Sam, and Sariah? No rod for them either. Le Le Lehi hasn't seen it yet. How'd they get there? They followed the beckoning call and the loud voice of a servant of God. It's so interesting the ways that the Lord has to draw us unto him. Well, it's only when Laman and Lemuel refuse to that dad's got to get a little more creative. Where Lehi really starts to look everywhere and see, are there any tools that will help my wayward sons come back? They're not the easy ones. They don't just come when called. And so what else is there? And as he scans the horizon and looks for any possible assistance, it's then and only then that he finally sees the rod. Next week we will talk about the rod with a possible interpretation that just might blow your mind. It was new to me when I read about it just a couple of weeks ago. Okay, So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, he sees this rod and it, it's meant to help guide people toward the tree. In fact, once he sees the rod, he notices right by it is a path, a straight and narrow one. Oh, so the, it, there's an easier way to get here. Just, you don't have to take my word for it, sons. If there's some, some negative experiences here and you, you're not the easily, uh, let, easy, you're not malleable. You're not easily guided. Fine, do it your own way. Just grab the rod, follow the path. The rod will help you get here. This, I love that, especially once we see its interpretation next week. It's also then, though, because, well, I'll put it this way. Even with all that help, they still don't come. And even by the end of the dream, they still haven't come and partaken. And part of the problem is, yes, he's seen all these divine helps that God has provided. There's, there's, a, there's a, a path. There's a rod. And then the adversary is like, yeah. <laughs> but there's also a building. And there's also a mist of darkness. Because if those are divine helps to help people get there, then I need to have some some diabolical helps that will turn them away. 
In fact, in some ways, I mean, the, the order isn't, isn't always this way in the, in the text, but think about this as if it were some kind of cosmic chess match. And God and the devil taking turns, trying to influence people to go in one direction or the other. Imagine if it started like this. On, there's good and evil constantly at battle. We saw that for three weeks in a row in the book of Revelation just last month, right? So here's good versus evil. And first and foremost, good presents the tree of life. It's all that it is. That's, that's what consumed Lehi's vision. And so how does the devil counter? Evil comes and says, oh, okay, you provided the tree of life. I will provide a river of filthy water. We'll see what that represents last, uh, next week. But the river is the diabolical counterpart of the tree of life. Okay, it's, God, it's God's turn again. Back to the good side. What does he do? Well, to protect you from the river and keep you on the way to the tree, let me lay down a straight and narrow path. To which the devil says, fine, I'll see your straight and narrow path and raise you a great and spacious building. Can you hear the parallels? Or I guess in this case, the perpendiculars. Instead of straight and narrow, it's great and spacious. A good friend of mine just said, the path has to be narrow so that we immediately feel when we're off it. That there's not a ton of wiggle room. That's not to make it hard. It's to make it easier to know when we've slipped. I love that perspective. So the straight and narrow path, as opposed to a building so great, so spacious, man, talk about all, all comers welcome. Oh, come as you are and you'll never leave. Well, what does the Lord do to counter that? His next move is to give an iron rod that, again, will protect you from that great and spacious building, keep you grounded in the straight and narrow path, point your way to the tree. But the devil's not done. He says, fine, take your iron rod. Let me enshroud it in a mist of darkness so it does the people no good. To which the Lord says, fine. There may not be something to see, though the iron rod you can still hold and hang on to. I will give you, though, a beckoning prophet, to which the evil side says, fine, and I will counter that with the mocking crowd. Honestly, to go back and forth and back and forth and to see the eternal tug of war played out in front of us. And now, remember, who's the tar target audience? Laman and Lemuel. There you are, with, in the Valley of Decision. Forget the Valley of Lemuel. You're in the Valley of Decision. There's a river, and it's not the River Laman. It's not continually flowing into the Fountain of All Righteousness. It's, that, that's not where you're going to go. You've got to come to this tree. Please ignore the voices in the great and spacious building. Please listen to me. I'm begging you, beckoning you to come. But the choice is yours. Now, what's interesting, what, what Lehi does do, because like I said, he doesn't explain what these things represent. Wait for next week with Nephi's help. But what Lehi does in portraying the vision, he does describe four different kinds of people. Well, I should say four different groups of people. Uh, and because they're caught in the Valley of Decision, too. And the tugs and pulls of good versus evil, tree versus river, Path versus building, and so on. Where are they going to go? To me, what's amazing is these four groups of people roughly coincide with the four types of people Jesus talked about in the parable of the sower. And if you're unfamiliar with Lehi's dream, but familiar with the parable of the sower, match the two and you'll be amazed. Or vice versa, whichever one you know better and whichever one you know worse. In the parable of the sower, there's a spectrum that's really clear. It's less clear in 1 Nephi 8. But the spectrum in the parable of the sower, you have wayside soil on one extreme. Nothing ever grows there. That's like trying to plant something on the sidewalk. Next to that, you have the stony ground where things will grow. In fact, they grow pretty quick, but then they wither just as quickly once the sun starts beating down on them. There's no root there. There's no water source. Next level, we're moving in the right direction at least, is thorny ground. So many weeds. The plant actually stays and lives. It just doesn't produce any fruit. Ah, fruit. Isn't that what's on Lehi's mind? But it's so choked out by all of these thorns that it never produces anything. For that, you've got to go to the good ground. 
Now, in some ways, the, stony, the thorny ground was good. It grew not only plants, but weeds too. But the good ground, somebody's weeded. Somebody's overturned. Somebody's pulled out the stones. Somebody's tilled and, and fertilized, I'm sure. And what grows there? Plants that bring forth fruit. You with me? Now, if those are the four across the spectrum, and the Lord is constantly trying to pull us in the direction of good ground, that's why he breaks up the hard earth of the wayside. That's why he pulls out uh, stones, why he weeds. Whereas the adversary is trying to pull everything in his direction. He's planting weeds or tares, as he likes to call them. He's introducing stones. He's drying up living water, or at least trying to, knock, uh, to, to separate you from any access to it. He's trying to pack it down so you're a hardened heart, right? So here's the tugs and pulls. Here's the chess match going on. But now look at these four in terms of Lehi's dream. We'll go out of scriptural order so we can stick with the order of the parable of the sower. It's just simpler that way. Number one, first is the wayside soil, and you see them in verses 31 through 33. I'll read it. He also saw other multitudes feeling their way towards that great and spacious building. Notice they're following their feelings too. Once the mist of darkness comes in, you can't see the path, but you can feel the iron rod, right? I'm so interested by those that, again, want to chalk up spiritual experience to mere elevated emotion and then want to say, oh, so emotion doesn't play any part in your life? Really? Aren't you feeling your way in other directions? Well, they were feeling their way toward the great and spacious building. It came to pass that many were drowned in the depths of the fountain. Think about that swallowed up in sin. They couldn't even see the river, which is probably exactly what the adversary was after. Interesting thing about those mists of darkness is not only does it obscure your view of the tree, that's your goal, not only does it obscure your view of the path and the rod, that's how you get to your goal, but it also obscures your view of the river, which is the consequences of your sins. In some ways, I wonder if the great and spacious building is almost like a mirage floating out there on the other side just to coax people away so they drown. Well, that's what's happening here. Now, at, to this point, we haven't seen them touch the iron rod. We haven't seen them place a, 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 put a foot, not even a toe, on the, the straight and narrow path. They are going straight toward the great and spacious building. That's why I would chalk them up as wayside souls. There's no growth at all. The seed doesn't even penetrate the, 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 the crust. Okay, so they're feeling their way directly to the great spacious building. They're drowned in the depths of the fountain. Many were lost from his view. Think about that. They're out of sight of prophetic guidance. They don't want to be beckoned to. They don't want to be told with a loud voice where to go. No, I'm, I'm trying to get lost. And they are. In fact, it says they were wandering in strange roads. And strange in the 1828 dictionary is interesting. We always think it means odd and unusual. And yes, that is a definition in Joseph Smith's day. But the first definition in that dictionary, strange means foreign, belonging to another country. Mm, that's, a, that's a building built in Babylon, not Zion. Okay? The, the roads, those strange roads, are leading in directions away from the presence of God, for, to a foreign country. Now, great was the multitude that did enter into that strange building, Nephi says. So, that's where some of them ended up. Some get drowned, some get distracted, and some get indoctrinated. Whether they're swallowed up in the river, whether they're wandering in strange roads, or whether they're pulled toward the great and spacious building where they stay. Okay, that's the first group, wayside. Second type of soil is stony ground. You'll see them in verse 21 through 23. This is actually the first group that Lehi mentions. He says, I saw numberless concourses of people, many of whom were pressing forward, so far so good, that they might obtain the path. So they're not on it yet, but they want to get there. They start pressing forward till they arrive. And now I can start moving toward that tree to obtain the path which led into the tree by which I stood. It came to pass that they did come forth and commence in the path which led to the tree. So they're on it. They're making progress. That's good. It's, the seed has penetrated the crust. It came to pass that there arose a mist of darkness. Oh, this is going to be an interesting metaphor to, in some ways, take the place of the stones in the stony ground. But it's going to stop their progress, okay, either way. So there arose a mist of darkness, yea, even an exceedingly great mist of darkness. Don't want to see anything through it. 
insomuch that they who had commenced in the path did lose their way, that they wandered off and were lost. You see, the reason I connect this with the stony ground is because on stony ground, the plant did grow up quickly. It sprouted. It, it started on the path. But when things got hard, it shriveled up. It withered. It died. It was burnt by the heat of a beating sun. Well, here it's blinded by these mists of darkness. But they couldn't move forward. When Jesus interprets the parable of the sower, he describes those stones as, and the heat of the sun, I should say, as tribulation and persecution and affliction and temptation. All those things get in the way of our spiritual progress. He said that those plants had no root in themselves, no access to the living water. Oh, no wonder they got swallowed up in the filthy water of the river. They're just looking for some kind of water source. It's interesting to see this group of people that begin the journey but just don't continue it. Okay? Though that's not as bad as the third group. Because on thorny ground, you, you made it in some ways. Like I said, this is good enough soil for both plants and, or for both wheat and tares to grow. Both good plants and not so good. Okay? It's just a matter of what will I do with the fruit? Because on thorny ground, I don't bear any. And in Lehi's dream, this is the second group that he lists. This is verse 24 and 25. It came to pass that I beheld others pressing forward. So far, so good. They came forth and caught hold of the end of the rod of iron. That's even better. The stony ground group didn't do that. They got on the path, but didn't do a thing with the iron rod. Okay, I don't need it. There's, there's probably easier ways to get there than having to hold on to that thing. No, but this group, they caught hold of the end of it. They did press forward through the mist of darkness, clinging to the rod of iron. Remember that verb. Even until they did come forth and partake of the fruit of the tree. <sighs> they made it. Here they are. They've eaten something like they've never tasted before. This is good ground. But after they had partaken of the fruit of the tree, they did cast their eyes about as if they were ashamed. Interesting if you pay attention to the language because Lehi cast his eyes about right after he ate the fruit too. But why? To look for people he could share it with in hopes of finding his family. He looked around lo looking, wondering what people needed and knowing they needed the, the fruit. As opposed to this group who looks around wondering what people think about them for having eaten it. <laughs> oh, look, they got juice dripping down their chin. Oh, how funny. Uh, a bunch of fruit eaters over there. Don't they know how high in carbs that is? I mean, come on. Whatever they were saying to make that group feel ashamed to the point that if we go back to the parable of the sower, there's no more fruit in the scene. They made it. They were so close. They're on good ground. How could you let your best hopes, your greatest potential, get swallowed up in thorns, which Jesus defines as the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things, the pleasures of this life, sound like the great and spacious building? Because that's where the shame is coming from. Listen to what Lehi says in verse 26 through 28. I also cast my eyes round about. Because he's curious. Why would anyone drop this fruit? Why would anyone feel ashamed of the most glorious thing they've ever experienced? So he's, he's casting his eyes for a second time. Very different than his first. And now for the first time he realizes, oh, there's something over there. He beheld on the other side of the river of water a great and spacious building. Again, the counterpart to the straight and narrow path. It stood, as it were, in the air, high above the earth, which is a fascinating detail. There's no foundation of prophets and apostles. There's no chief cornerstone of Christ to build upon. There's no roots. It's not firmly planted. It's blown about by every wind of doctrine. 
It's controlled by the prince of the powers of the air. I mean, you could keep listing <laughs> analogies here. In Jonathan Swift's masterpiece, Gulliver's Travels, what did he see in the third voyage where he's making fun, satirizing, enlightenment, rationalism? He sees an island floating in the air. That's such a great depiction of academia, so-called. Head in the clouds, no feet on the ground. Oh, just a great and spacious building. In fact, it's a great and spacious <laughs> head that's full of itself. There's intellectual pride for you. But in this one, what's going on in that great and spacious building? How do people even get in there if it's floating above the air? Maybe it really is that mirage, and it's just trying to coax people away from the tree so they end up getting drowned on the way. They can't see the river through the mists of darkness. Maybe it's a, that's why it needed to float above it in hopes so that you can, oh, just raise your sights. Look over here. You can be above everyone. Now keep reading. It was filled with people. So yeah, there's no shortage of people caught up in worldly ways. Babylon has a high population. They're both old and young, both male and female. So yeah, Satan's no respecter of persons either. None of us are immune from, uh, to his worldly influences. Their manner of dress was exceedingly fine. Sounds like they focus on outward appearances. Worldliness, materialism are, part of, are some of their problems. They were in the attitude of mocking and pointing their fingers towards those who had come at and were partaking of the fruit. Ooh, that's where the shame came from. And after they had tasted of the fruit, they were ashamed because of those that were scoffing at them. And they fell away into forbidden paths and were lost. The earlier group got lost in strange roads. Well, these ones are worse than strange. They're straight up forbidden. Either way, they're lost, though. Hmm. Drowning? Wandering? Or somehow, I don't know how, some people actually made it to that great and spacious building? And what are they doing all day? Elder Maxwell used to joke at this and says, Why? Isn't there anything better to do in the great and spacious building? Don't, don't they have a bowling alley or something to keep themselves occupied? But no. Again, those are those who leave the church and can't leave the church alone, like Elder Maxwell said elsewhere. And all they can do is laugh and mock and point the finger. When I read this in Spanish for the first time, I, I, was, I just got my mission call. I wasn't an expert. I wasn't fluent. But I was plowing my way through the Book of Mormon. I got here. I didn't, I didn't know the word in Spanish for point. In English, it's point. In Spanish, it's señalar con el dedo. And I was reading that, and I'm like, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. I didn't know it was a, a, a way of, of saying it, so I just took it word for word. Señalar means to signal. Con means with, el means the, and dedo means finger. So they laughed and signaled with the finger. <laughs> All of a sudden, my eyes got wide. I'm like, hmm, that puts a different spin on it. But yeah, I've seen some do that too. Uh, they're signaling with fingers all right. But in this case, mm, full of venom, full of anger, full of scorn, mocking. You know what's interesting? I mentioned already that I had did, done that study of, of every newspaper account that described the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and how quickly they reduced the story to the absurd. That's all it was. And the more I studied it, and then began to expand beyond anti-Mormonism to study anti-Catholicism or anti-Protestantism, anti-Baptists, anti-Methodists, anti-Shakerism, it's all over the place. I realized that the common denominator throughout it all, well, not all, but almost all, is the rhetoric of ridicule. It's everywhere. That became my dissertation topic as I was studying. I was going to go throughout the entire 19th century and just try to identify the, the, the rhetoric of ridicule that was targeting the Bible. But I got so caught up in the hilarity of Thomas Paine that I ended up doing 400 pages just on him. How oh, they mock. It's, it's exactly what's happening with the Great and Spacious Building. To the point that now when I hear somebody making fun of a rival position, the red flags go up, and I go, huh, you're unsure of your own position. That's why you're trying to make fun of the opposite. If you can reduce them to the absurd, then you're the only one left standing, and you win by default. It's like politics, where you don't trust your own platform, so you attack the, your, your opponent. And it's character assassination. It's, it's reducing them to the absurd, and it happens all the time. 
there was a, a, in the last oh, decade or two, there was a convention of atheists and their patron saint, no irony intended there, said at one point, we must laugh Christianity out of existence. We've got to mock them into oblivion. Mark Twain, who I've told you before, was make, made fun of the Book of Mormon and the Bible to no end. In one of his most famous lines, he has one of his characters. In this case, it's Satan himself. It's so interesting. The devil says in a, in a book called The Mysterious Stranger that against the assault of laughter, nothing can stand. Think about that the next time you get made fun of. And if, you've, and if, it's, if it's been a while, just think back to the last time it happened. And sure enough, it's hard. It's hard not to feel shame when the mocking, scoffing, sarcastic jabs, and yet it's an admission on their side. Those kings and queens of so-called reason are abdicating it. And those that are making fun of your elevated emotion are using an elevated emotion of their own. Oh, I've done all kinds of study on the politics of humor from a psychological, from a sociological, from a philosophical standpoint, and it is fascinating. I, I agree with Mark Twain. Until you have the eyes to see through the rhetorical sleight of hand and realize that laughter, it's smoke and mirrors. And it only affects me if I let it. Unfortunately, these people let it. But the people on good ground didn't. That's a huge difference. So for this final group, uh, it's, the, it's the third group that Lehi lists, but it's the fourth of our group. It's the good ground. They're growing. They're bringing forth fruit because they're partaking of it. And I'm sure as soon as they ate it, they're looking around for other people to be able to share it with. They're casting their eyes in the good way, in Lehi's original way. But read about them in verse 30. He saw other multitudes pressing forward. Ooh, that was the same as the previous group. They came and caught hold of the end of the rod of iron. Mm, that was same as previous group as well. They did press their way forward, but here's where it gets different. Continually holding fast to the rod of iron. That's, that's what makes the difference. And they did it until they came forth and fell down, that's different too, and partook of the fruit of the tree. Now, compare that to the clinging we saw from that previous group. I told you to hold on to that verb, because I think there is a world of difference between clinging to the iron rod versus continually holding fast to it. Uh, back in my younger dating days, there was a, a horrible word you hoped never would get attached to you if you were in a budding relationship. And the word was clingy. Because if you're clingy in a relationship, then yeah, you're high maintenance because you're probably really scared of losing the other person. So you're just trying to cling to them. Not, don't let them out of your sight. And I worry about those who are clinging to the iron rod out of a sense of fear. Because fear is what's going to play into shame as soon as, somebody, as, as soon as the person you're afraid of starts pointing, starts signaling with the finger and starts mocking you. No, we cannot come unto Christ out of fear. Even if it's fear of not coming unto him or fear of consequences if I don't do what's right. That kind of scrupulosity, that kind, that's not the right motivation and that kind of fear will typically be joined by fear of man, in which case you, know, you, might, you might fall to them eventually. Whereas continually holding fast, that has, to me at least has a different connotation. It suggests courage rather than fear. Courage born of commitment. Courage born of covenant. In, in the hymn book, in The Iron Rod, I love the line, and hand or hand the rod along. Hand or hand. It's like, I think sometimes we just kind of take our hand and kind of oh, stroll along the straight and narrow path and kind of touch the iron rod every now and again or just let our hands slide across the top. 
No, I think we need to be continually holding fast and hand or hand. It's like driving 10 and 2, right? And then as you're turning, you're moving the hand. You're not just <laughs> spinning, the, spinning the steering wheel. You're not, you're not navigating by your knee, that's for sure. No, I've got two hands on the wheel at all times. And hand or hand along the rod I go. That's continually holding fast. And by the time I get to the tree and partake of the fruit, I have fallen down in humble gratitude. Maybe some exhaustion there too. It's an uphill battle sometimes. Uh, but I fell down at the feet of the Savior, at the roots of the tree. And if I'm that humble and humbled by the gift that he's given me in that fruit, then that same humility will protect me from the pride in the great and spacious building because that pride is just looking for similar pride in me. It's that pride that makes me fear what they think. Meanwhile, they're probably scared of what we think too. How oh, strange things going on in that strange building that can only be reached by going down strange roads if it can be reached at all. Do you understand what Lehi is describing here? It's absolutely incredible to me. This is an absolute masterpiece of, of scripture, uh, of symbolism, of metaphor, of find the moral to the story, Laman and Lemuel, because I'm not going to give it to you. I'm just going to tell the story and let you sit there with it and decide how you're going to respond. You're going to be pulled and tugged between these two opposing poles. And you'll have to determine what you'll do. Now, let me give you one last clue, though, because when it talks about those that stayed at the tree as opposed to those who ate and ran, notice verse 33 and 34. I love these verses. First, Lehi laments that great was the multitude that did enter into that strange building. And sure enough, after they entered into that building, they did point the finger of scorn at me and those that were partaking of the fruit also. So that's where you see the other groups and why they fell away and so on. But those who didn't notice this all-important phrase, but we heeded them not. And that's so important that Nephi reiterates it. He confirms it. These are the words of my father, colon. So put this in quotes. For as many as heeded them had fallen away. Now that should open our eyes. Why do people leave the fruit? Because they heed voices that are pulling them away from it. They are being influenced. There is a separate persuasive power after all. And though Nephi is doing all within his power to fulfill the fullness of his intent, which is to persuade people to come to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and be saved, there is a countervailing force that is trying to persuade and pull and pressure people away. Scorn, mockery, derision, ridicule, false promises of fine twined linen and, ex and clothing that's exceedingly fine, promises of popularity and pride, I mean, because this place is filled with people, old, young, male, female, come, on, come aboard. That's so restrictive over there at the tree. There's only one thing to eat. Over here, we can eat, drink, eat, drink and be merry. So come on over. Uh, we are caught between the, the opposing poles. And we'll decide whether, well, we'll decide who we're going to listen to. I'm always fascinated when skeptics will accuse faithful Latter-day Saints of just being blind followers. And yet I see a lot of blind following on the skeptical side. Well, I read that letter. I heard that podcast. Uh, so many of my friends are leaving. They must know something I don't know. And then, like lemmings, we go. We, we've got to be careful. We have to think and ponder and pray and decide who to heed and who not to. This actually struck me very strongly once when I was in the temple during an endowment session. And I'll be purposely vague uh, about this, but there's a moment in the endowment when, well, I'll just tell you what, what struck me and you'll be able to figure out when this occurred. 
it, the, the thought dawned on me that sometimes an act of faith is in reality an act of courageous skepticism. Because believing one voice means I'm skeptical of the other. If I'm believing the voices in the Great and Spacious Building, I'm skeptical of the prophet beckoning me from the tree. But if I believe that prophet, who's crying to me to come in a loud voice, then I'm being skeptical of the mocking, scorning, pointing fingers of the, of the people in the building, right? And so when you think about the world around you, and so many people, right, multitudes in the building, so many people leaning or going in that direction, and they're falling hook, line, and sinker for the smoke and mirrors of the world, then you look around and go, wait a minute, why, is, why isn't that person leaving? Why is that person staying strong? D doesn't, don't they believe what's being peddled here in Babylon? Don't they care about the voices from the Great and Spacious Building? Don't they believe them? And when you can say with faith, yeah, not, not this guy, not this girl. Everyone else may be falling prey to it. The world's clever messaging. But not these ones. These ones are skeptics in the best of ways. And it's a courageous act of skepticism to do it. I hope that made sense. Okay, Those that have ears to hear, let them hear. And if you can't hear it yet, go, to, go back to the temple. <laughs> now, with all of that, uh, this story comes to an end. And sadly, with a, a, it's a, a sad ending. Because the way Lehi finishes the, the, the parable, if you want to call it that, is with the sad conclusion, verse 35, that Laman and Lemuel partook not of the fruit. That's it. But the interesting thing is, they hadn't joined any of the four groups yet. They weren't yet on the path. They're still out in the, the spacious field. In some ways, they're still in the dark and dreary <laughs> waste because they haven't prayed for mercy and, and vision. But that does mean all the big choices lie ahead of them. And my oldest sons in the Valley of Decision, what will you do? Please, please listen to my loud voice. <laughs> Hearken to my beckoning call. Lay hold of the iron rod. It will get you through the mist of darkness. Come and partake. It will, this taste, this flavor will save you. And if you can ignore all the influences that are trying to pull you away, you will stay here at the fruit with your family forever. That's Lehi's greatest hope. And so what does he do when it's all is said and done? This is so fascinating because, again, he doesn't explain it. We're going to, we'll have to wait for Nephi's help with next week. But notice what he says in verse 37. Verse 36 says he exceedingly feared for them. I am so worried about you. Okay, Not so afraid that I'm clingy, but I'm going to continually hold fast. And here's how I'll do it. Verse 37. He did exhort them then. And... I want to define exhort in just a moment, but hold on to that word. He exhorted them with all the feeling of a tender parent. Because it's feeling, after all, either feeling the rod or feeling the pull of love or feeling the path beneath your feet, feeling the fruit in your hand or better yet, in your mouth, or feeling your way toward the great and spacious building. Either way, this is the feeling of a tender parent. And he exhorted them with all that feeling that they would hearken to his words. That perhaps, and that's an interesting admission, perhaps the Lord would be merciful to them and not cast them off. Yea, my father did preach unto them. Now, think about this loving parent and what he's trying to do. And now we can build on the lessons we learned back in chapter 7 from Nephi. How do I deal with wayward siblings? Well, in this case, how do I deal with prodigal sons? And what does he do? He balances justice and mercy, which is interesting, because he's promising the Lord's mercy, but he's also saying perhaps. So there's a nod to both mercy and justice. We've got to find the Goldilocks zone on this one, boys. We've got to prove these contraries. But I trust in the multitude of God's tender mercies. That's why the light came on for me and I saw the tree. But once you know that about him and pray for it, forget the perhaps. 
he will be merciful. But you got to trust his justice as well. Part of this is his preaching to him. And that's, that could be a scary word because I've heard from oh, quite a few people who've left the church that one of the things that drove them out was the preachiness of people, even their own parents. So I looked up preach in the 1828 dictionary to make sure that I was on the same page as the translator of this record. And the word, the first definition of preach is what you would expect, a public discourse on a religious subject. But that's, I don't think that's what Lehi's doing. I don't think he's getting preachy and making, because that's sometimes what preachiness feels like. It's like, whoa, is, are the cameras on? Are you in some mega church uh, trying to pass around the, the, the basket? I mean, it's just you and me, Dad. Don't get preachy on me. Well, here's the second definition from 1828's dictionary. To preach is to discourse on the gospel way of salvation and to exhort, and that's the other word we used, to exhort to repentance. To discourse on evangelical truths and exhort, there's that word again, to a belief of them and acceptance of the terms of salvation. And I do believe you can preach without getting preachy. As you're not standing at the pulpit, you're certainly not pounding it. But to try to explain in ways that your children or loved ones would understand the way of salvation, to just talk about this is the best way to live. If you want greater happiness and peace and rest, do what Abraham did. Seek the blessings of the Father. You want happiness, peace, and rest? You want delicious and pure and life-changing? Then come to the, tr the tree and eat its fruit. Ah, there's some good preaching for you. And exhorting, that might come across as too strong, as if I'm, I'm being forceful and as long as you're living under my roof, you're going to come to church with me. Well, prepare what's going to happen when they no longer live under your roof then, and they're going to try to get to that point as quickly as they can. But how's this for an 1828 dictionary definition of exhort? To encourage, to embolden, to cheer, to advise. The primary sense seems to be to excite or to give strength, spirit, or courage. I love that. that Lehi's not being threatening. He's not shaming. You don't, sh you don't counter shame with shame. You don't shame people into partaking of the fruit. Because that makes them all the more likely to be shamed out of it. Okay, it, there, no, there needs to be exhortation, but the kind that exercises no unrighteous dominion. Go back and read Doctrine and Covenants 121. Okay, I love this. But then notice the last verse. I love this even more. What we saw about preaching and exhorting and the feelings of a tender parent, that should, that's the emoji for you. Okay, if Nephi was speaking out of godly sorrow, here Lehi is preaching and exhorting out of tenderness gentleness, meekness, love unfeigned, right? He's, it, there's feeling here. He loves these boys. And so verse 38, after he had preached unto them and also prophesied unto them of many things, he bade them to keep the commandments of the Lord. And then my favorite line, and he did cease speaking unto them. That's it. That is so wise of him. In fact, it's the Samuel principle all over again. The three parts. On the one side, your will side of things, it's protest solemnly unto them. That's the preaching and exhorting part. It's the show them the future of their decision, the consequences of their choice. What's he doing here? He's prophesying unto them of many things. But throughout it all, and especially at the end of the day, what do you do, Samuel? You hearken to their voice. What do you do, Nephi? Well, if ye have choice, and you do, what do you do, Lehi? You know when to shut up. You know when to cease speaking. And prove to them that you believe in them, even if you fear for them. <laughs> that you trust in the tender mercies of a father in heaven that cares for their souls even more than you do. You want to talk about the, the feelings of a tender parent. Capitalize the P and look no, for, no further than tender parents in heaven who have every prodigal's best interest at heart. They honor agency as well as sending the spirit to exhort and to prophesy. We know how God feels about things. 
He helps us see hints of what's coming down either path that we follow. But he lets us choose. Most mercifully of all, he sent his son so that we could remake some of those decisions. Trust that too. In fact, that's what chapter 10 is about. And though we're way over time, as usual, I'm, I'm sorry, not sorry, I'll keep trying. But chapter 10, and I'm going to skip the last handful of verses because they fit better with chapter 11 next week. But the first 16 verses or so, I'm amazed at Lehi's testimony of Christ. Because that, that's the tree for you. That's the fruit for you. That's the iron rod and the path, uh, the, the straight and narrow path. It's all Jesus. I, I told you that Lehi didn't explain what they all meant. Well, in a way he does, because in chapter 10, he focuses on the Savior and Redeemer of the world. Namely, the Messiah of the house of Israel. Also known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Since this family's full intent is to persuade you to come unto him to be saved. Now, unfortunately, chapter 10 gets lost in the shuffle. We're so quick to jump from chapter 8 to chapter 11. Because we want to see Lehi's dream and then Nephi's visions that explain it. But then you skip over chapter 9 with its beautiful, make two versions of this and trust me, I know what I'm doing. And then chapter 10 which I'll just fly through very briefly. What ends up happening in chapter 10, verse 1, this is worth pointing out, Nephi says, I, Nephi, proceed to give an account upon these plates of my proceedings and my reign and ministry. And he said he would do this. Way back in chapter 1, I didn't read this last week, but in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, he tells us, I'm first going to abridge my dad's stuff, and then I'm going to start with my own. And here's when it happens. Chapter 10, verse 1 is his pivot point. I'm done talking about dad's stuff. I'm now ready to start the record of my own ministry. But then notice the irony. As soon as he says that, I'm going to talk about my reign and ministry. By now he's king. This is the end of 2 Nephi and he's looking back and writing all this stuff. Wherefore, to proceed with mine account, I must speak somewhat of the things of my father and also of my brother. And that's always kind of confused me. It's like, okay, I'm done with dad. And the first thing I'm going to talk about now that I'm going to talk about me is my dad. You're like, uh, Nephi, you're not making a lot of sense here. It's like, actually, I, I'm trying to. Because what I'm going to quote from my father now lays the foundation of my ministry. In some ways, chapter nine, excuse me, chapter 8, which comes from Lehi, and chapter 10, which also comes from Lehi, draw the dividing line between them, though, and the tree of life is the the grand finale of Lehi's mission. And what he's going to talk about now, which is about another tree, lays the foundation for all that Nephi will build upon from this point forward. It's really fascinating how that works. Okay? In fact, by the time we get to chapter 15 at the end of next week's lesson, we'll see which chapter Laman and Lemuel were more interested in. Was it dad's words in 8 or dad's words in 10? Was which tree captured their imagination? Hold on for next week for that. But notice verse 3. Uh, actually, verse 2, he's going to give you some... some he's gonna, he wants to talk about the things of the Jews. Okay, I've got to give you some stuff concerning the Jews, and it's about their future history, what, what he would call prophecy. Okay? For us, it's history. For him, it's, it's prophecy. But verse 3, let's read it together. After they should be destroyed, the Jews, that is, even that great city, Jerusalem, and many be carried away captive into Babylon, and that's what we've been warned about way back in chapter 1, so, yep, he's seeing it happen. According to the own due time of the Lord, they shall return again, yea, even be brought back out of captivity. And after they should be brought back out of captivity, they should possess again the land of their inheritance. Now, that right there, 1 Nephi 10, verse 3, as far as I can tell, is the Book of Mormon's earliest mention of the gathering of Israel. And notice it is intensely personal for Lehi and his family. Because what's happened to them? They got scattered. They've been uprooted. They've been cast out. They didn't get dragged captive to Babylon, but they, they were told to leave Jerusalem, the land of their inheritance. So we talk about this kind of national scattering of Israel. Well, Le Lehi and his family were experiencing a very personal one. We got scattered too. So what does he do from there? Hey, this is where the Book of Mormon makes its greatest contribution to a discussion of the 
of the gathering of Israel. And this will be a theme that will run from here to the very end. In some ways, you could say the Book of Mormon is about the scattering and gathering of Israel. The first family got scattered. They're going to be wondering, how do I get gathered? Well, here's the answer. And this is the Book of Mormon's best contribution. Verse 4 and 5. He seems to change the subject, but no, he's continuing to prophesy. Yea, even 600 years from the time that my father left Jerusalem, a prophet would the Lord God raise up among the Jews. Mm, let, me, let me rephrase that. Even a Messiah. Mm, let me rephrase that. Or in other words, a savior of the world. Wow, he just got promoted three times in quick succession. He's no, just, he's no mere prophet. He's not even a mere Messiah. That's too, oh, too local. That's too parochial or provincial. That's just Messiah of King of the Jews. Oh, no, no. He's Savior of the world. And he also spake concerning the prophets, Lehi did, how great a number had testified of these things concerning this Messiah of whom he had spoken, or better said, this Redeemer of the world. What I love about the Book of Mormon's emphasis on the gathering of Israel is that it places it all within a very specifically intentionally, intensely Christian context. Because here, from the very first mention, this is going to be a messianic move. And again, it's not just some kind of local Messiah. It's the Savior of the world. It's the Redeemer of the world. Jesus, he doesn't know his name yet, but he will be the good shepherd and he will gather every lost lamb, every stray sheep. That's what the gathering is all about. It's not just a geographical one. It's a spiritual one because he's the savior of all humanity. In fact, it's along those theological lines that you see the next verse, verse 6. Wherefore, all mankind, remember, it's, it's savior and redeemer of the world not just a geographically scattered Israel. All mankind were in a lost and a fallen state and ever would be, save they should rely on this Redeemer. You starting to see the Book of Mormon's purpose poking through right there? Convincing us that Jesus is the Christ, persuading us to come unto him and be saved. We're all in this lost and fallen state. In fact, it's almost as if we are wandering through a wilderness. Almost as if we are following a white-robed figure through a dark and dreary waste. Huh. But if we'll just rely on the Redeemer, all mankind, all humanity can be saved. You see, this is what the future of the house of Israel entails. This is the point of these prophecies. Lehi will actually get miraculously specific. And while he's talking about Jesus, though he doesn't know his name, he'll then talk about John the Baptist, though he doesn't, doesn't know his name either. He'll talk about this Messiah being baptized. He'll call him the Lamb of God. Oh, that has all kinds of sacrificial uh, symbols, overtones. Uh, he will talk about this Messiah being rejected by the Jews, even though he tried to share with that house of Israel his gospel. But the rejection will result in his death. We're seeing scattering of Israel in light of the death of the Messiah. But then he also mentions the resurrection of the Messiah. And that accounts for the gathering of Israel. It's the bad news and the good news, just in different aspects. Scattering, gathering, crucifixion, resurrection. It's all right here. And then verse 12 is where it all comes together and a new tree is planted. Yea, even my father spake much concerning the Gentiles. Because that was the last bit of Lehi's prophecy. You see, after the death and resurrection of the Messiah, the Gentiles would receive the Holy Spirit and thereby learn about this Lamb of God. They'd also learn about the house of Israel that the Messiah had come to save, and they'll start to realize their own role in redeeming them, in gathering them. That's the point that Lehi is going to make here, and the point that the Book of Mormon will make repeatedly from this point on. This is a book destined to come to the Gentiles, so they'll know what to do to bring it to the Jews. Let's read the verse. 
he spake much concerning the Gentiles and also concerning the house of Israel, that they should be compared like unto an olive tree, whose branches should be broken off and should be scattered upon all the face of the earth. Ah, there's the second tree. The tree of life. There's the focal point of the gathering. That's what we're coming to. That's the, the destination once we see the path and find the rod. So the tree of life, 1 Nephi 8, is the point of the gathering. Meanwhile, the olive tree, the point of chapter 10, is the symbol of the scattering. They're breaking branches off. Those of you who remember Zenos' allegory of the olive tree, mm, this, is, this is where we start to see it in Lehi's teaching. But then he makes it far more personal in verse 13. Wherefore he said, it must needs be that we, that's how personal it is, we, the family of Lehi, Sariah and Nephi and Sam and Laman and Lemuel and their wives and everybody here, we should be led with one accord into the land of promise unto the fulfilling of the word of the Lord that we should be scattered upon all the face of the earth. Huh, we always talk about being gathered to the land of promise. Well, in this family's case, they're being scattered to the land of promise. But it's all so that God can keep all his promises, including gathering scattered Israel back to the original land of promise. There's going to end up being two lands of promises, each with its own Jerusalem, old and new, to which all nations shall gather before Christ himself, the resurrected Messiah, Savior, Redeemer of the world, comes to both sides of the world. There's something beautiful here. That's how personal it is for Lehi. We're getting scattered, but it's part of God's purposes. Son, you weren't sure about making two different sets of plates? Well, I wasn't sure about having two different, you know, planting two different kinds of trees. Certainly wasn't sure about two different lands of promise. But I trust God, just like you did. Then, now that it's been, more per it's been personalized, now let's universalize it. Verse 14, After the house of Israel should be scattered, they should be gathered together again. Or in fine, after the Gentiles had received the fullness of the gospel, the natural branches of the olive tree that is, the remnant of the house of Israel, should be grafted in, or, let me make the symbolism clear, or come to the knowledge of the true Messiah, their Lord, and their Redeemer. And that is what Nephi's whole ministry is going to be about. That's why he includes this as the preface to his ministry rather than the grand finale to his father's. He'll let dad have the tree of life. He wants to stake a claim on the olive tree. And for the rest of, Le of Nephi's ministry, every time he quotes Isaiah, and he'll do that often, brace yourself, uh, all that he does in working with Laman and Lemuel, because again, they're his target audience, just like it was for his dad. They're the ones I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to work hardest to persuade to come unto the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and be saved. They're the ones that most need to be convinced that Jesus is the Christ. Because Jesus is going to be the Lord of the gathering. They're the ones that need to know of the tender mercies of the Lord. That they're over all whom he has chosen because of their faith. To make them mighty under the power of deliverance. Deliverance delivered from their scattered state. I'm blown away by everything that's been described here. Chapter 10 is such a masterpiece, just a, a forgotten gemstone that we skip over at our own peril. Next week, when we pick up where we left off and see the end of this chapter and how it springboard, springboards into chapter 11, you'll see all that Nephi learns about what Dad has taught us today. But thank you, Lehi, and thank you, Nephi, for being such good teachers. By way of review, if I can just run through a bunch of beautiful one-liners, pause whenever you want, uh, take some screenshots, write yourself a sacrament meeting talk, or a family home meeting lesson, or a quick missionary devotional based on any of these passages, and, and you'll have some amazing insights come as a result. But here's, here's the list from today's material. I desire the room that I may write of the things of God. 
The fullness of mine intent is that I may persuade men to come unto the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and be saved. The things which are pleasing unto the world I do not write, but the things which are pleasing unto God and unto those that are not of the world. Raise up seed unto the Lord in the land of promise. Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, How is it that ye have forgotten? The Lord is able to do all things according to his will for the children of men, if it so be that they exercise faith in him. Ye shall know at some future period that the word of the Lord shall be fulfilled. The spirit of the Lord ceaseth soon to strive with them. O Lord, according to my faith which is in thee, wilt thou deliver me? I did frankly forgive them all that they had done. And after I had traveled for the space of many hours in darkness, I began to pray unto the Lord that he would have mercy on me according to the multitude of his tender mercies. And as I partook of the fruit thereof, it filled my soul with exceedingly great joy. I began to be desirous that my family should partake of it also. They stood as if they knew not whither they should go. And after they had tasted of the fruit, they were ashamed because of those that were scoffing at them. And they did press their way forward, continually holding fast to the rod of iron. Many were lost from his view, wandering in strange roads. But we heeded them not. He did exhort them then with all the feeling of a tender parent. He did cease speaking unto them. For a wise purpose in him, which purpose I know not. But the Lord knoweth all things from the beginning. He hath all power unto the fulfilling of all his words. A Messiah, or in other words, a Savior of the world. Rely on this Redeemer. The natural branches of the olive tree or the remnants of the house of Israel should be grafted in or come to the knowledge of the true Messiah, their Lord and their Redeemer. Ah, what a fitting invitation at the end of this week's class. Come unto Christ. Rely on this Redeemer. By the end of this year's study, if, if we are not convinced that Christ is approachable, welcoming, loving, filled with a multitude of tender mercies, then we haven't read the book right. My dear friends, come. I know I'm no prophet, far from it. But if I can use a loud voice, <laughs> amplified by the internet, and, and point in the right direction. If I can simply share what I've been able to taste on beautiful occasions when white robed messengers point me the direction I should go. Please choose well who you will heed because the choices you are making will make all the difference.